chapter. Thank you for just this body of believers that are coming together to just um, worship you and, and learn more about you. And we thank you for your word as we dig in an incredibly difficult passage. Um, obviously, we're not going to be able to understand the depths of this whole prophecy, but I hope we can walk away with just a little better understanding as we in the future read our Bibles and can plug things in and help us understand the big picture just a little better. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so I was going to, we're, gonna, we're in Daniel 9, I was going to um, take the two main views and try to go through Daniel 9. I'm not going to be able to do that. So I think what we're going to do is just take one view today, and then next week we'll take another view and kind of um, tie it together. But I just want to review a little bit so we can... Um, have some context or things to think about that we've talked about in the past. So Daniel 2, um, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He's troubled in his spirit by that dream. He needs it interpreted. God reveals that to Daniel. Um, And then the dream is, in verse 32, he's talking about the head of this image was of fine gold, the chest and the arms of silver, and the middle of the thighs bronze, and its legs of iron. It's its feet um, partly of iron and partly of clay. So he, he, he's seeing this image. He's wanting to know what it means. Daniel shows him in verse um, 38, the second half. It says, you are the head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king of what? Babylon, Babylon right? So this is, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. That second kingdom would be the Medo-Persians, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And this would be the this would be Greece, and there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, and this would be the Roman Empire. Then we see later in verse 44, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break its pieces in pieces, all these kingdoms, and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And this is the fifth kingdom. And we see this throughout. So we're going to see the same pattern in Daniel 7. So we have four kingdoms, and we have this fifth eternal kingdom that is going to last forever. Okay. Daniel 7, where we were a few weeks ago, we see in verse 3, we're going to see these four kingdoms again. The four great beasts came up from the sea, different from one another. Um, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And remember, this is apocalyptic literature. So it's referring to kingdoms and it's helping us understand these kingdoms. So this first kingdom, again, being Babylon. Verse 4, yeah, this, yes, verse 4, that's Babylon. Verse 5, and behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. This is the um, Medo-Persian kingdom. After this, I looked, and behold, another like like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And it had a beast that had four heads, and dominion was given to it. You see, this is the third kingdom, and this is Greece. And then after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke its broken pieces and stamped what was left with his feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This is the Roman Empire. And if you remember, this is the split on the understanding of the different views, where everybody up to this point saw this as these empires in the past, okay, which, which happened. We had the Babylonian Empire, we had the Medo-Persian Empire, we had the Greek per- Empire, then we have the Roman Empire. Now, and this is important to understand, there's these ten horns. Out from these ten horns, a little one emerges, okay? From a dispensational, premillennial view, everybody got their sheet? So everybody understands. Look at number two. 
Number two, and that's what we're going to focus on today, the pre-tribulational dispensational premillennialism. So this is number two. This is the one that says that out of the ten horns, the one will arise, and it will be in the future. And we're going to call this the Antichrist that's going to emerge, this little horn. That's future. The other three views said that's already happened. But I want you to focus on the future one because that's what we're going to look at in Daniel 9 today. Okay? And this same thing is, is what we're going to be talking about. John? Where did the other three views say that one was, that horn was? Well, that little horn could have, it was out of the Roman Empire, could have been um, the Pope, uh, the papacy, um, okay. different things like that. There was different views that it could have been. But doesn't the, really matter. It's it doesn't matter. really matter. It's already happened. That's the main thing we want to focus on that, that already did. But we're focusing on the future. So this little horn has not happened yet. Okay? Daniel 8. So there's disagreement in those two views on that. All the other three believe it was passed. Daniel 8. Um, Daniel 8 focuses on... Goes back to seven. So seven is the big picture. All four empires ending with the little horn and then the eternal kingdom. We see now in Daniel 8, it focuses on the third empire. And out of the third empire, Greece, Alexander the Great, after he dies, he breaks up his kingdom and to do his four generals. And then a little horn arises from that. And so now we see, which is interesting, we see a little horn. We see a little horn that comes in the third empire also. So you start to see, which I think you see, is, is types and patterns of what this Antichrist looks like. I believe there's one in the future, but I think we see types in that. In that and that Antichrist would be Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so that's the little horn that everybody agrees upon in Daniel 8. It literally was from the Greek Empire, Alexander, Alexander the Great. Then from the Seleucid Empire came um, Antiochus Epiphanes, the abomination of desolation in 167. We went into the temple, destroyed the temple, set up a, a Greek god, um, slaughtered a pig on the altar. All those things happened in that, that Maccabean period. Okay. Okay, so another little horn. Daniel 8. One other passage I want to flip to, back to Matthew 24. And this, is, this will come together. If you're lost, hopefully this will for this view. Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by, spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop go down, um, not go down to take what is in his house. So this is talking about that little horn. Okay, that we're going to see in Daniel 9 here in a minute. This is that Antichrist, that final Antichrist. In this view, future, they are seeing this passage, Matthew 24. As future Antichrist, they are seeing Daniel 7, after the, the, the four kingdoms, a little horn that arises in the future. And then we're going to see in Daniel 9, what's happening in Daniel 9 in the future. Is everybody somewhat tracking with me at the moment? Close? Okay, I see a few head nods. So, okay, so we're going to go to... Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ashuerus, by descendant Amid, by descent Amid, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the book of Numbers of Years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the the end of the desolation, desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So Daniel, 
the, the context of what we're talking about. Daniel is understanding from Jeremiah, the prophet, that he, they've been in exile for 70 years or close to it. Some would say he's probably been there about 69. And he knows from Jeremiah that this exile is 70 years. Okay, because think about it. After Solomon, the kingdom split into two, right? Northern, southern. The Assyrians wiped out the northern kingdom, I don't know, 722 or some, somewhere, in that, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, the southern kingdom lasted till the Babylonians came, okay, in 605. There was three different deportations that happened. They didn't, they didn't get wipe out Jerusalem until like um, 480 or no, 586, I think. So there was like, but Daniel went in 605. They took the nobles, the young men um, at that time. So that Daniel left at 605. And so he's sitting there thinking, okay, this 70 years could be up. So flip to Jeremiah real quick, just so we can look, give you the, the passage that he's, he's thinking of. Daniel 20, or Jeremiah 25. In verse 11. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste. So Daniel's telling them, this is what's going to happen. Babylon's going to come in. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then, after 70 years are complete, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation in the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. So interesting that God raises nations up (laughs) to use them for judgment, and then he comes and destroys them. It's... It's like God is sovereign. God is in control. Not that that, not that, that wouldn't have been the desires of the Babylonians, because it certainly would have been um, to destroy. But um, then in, in chapter 29, we see um, in verse 10, and most know verse 11, if you look at that, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. So here's the context behind that Actually, verse. <laughs> For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So he's going, God's going to bring us back to the land. And so this is what Daniel's thinking. He's thinking the time's probably coming. And then he, he gets on his knees in prayer. So this is what he's thinking. This is the context. So then in verse 3, we see verse 3 through 19 is the prayer of Daniel. And I'm going to read it so we can have this full context of what's happening. Then I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. And it's interesting. This is what he does. He falls down on his knees. He doesn't just go, well, God's going God's to do this. It's already done. It's already decided. It's decreed. So, but what does he do? He falls on his face and says, and he prays to the Lord. We're a sinful nation. We're a sinful people. And I, and, and, and who, but he prays in, in, according to who God is, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. And then verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly, wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants and prophets, servants the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our fathers, and to all the people to, of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As at this day to the men of Judea, Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws which he set before us by his servants and prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. 
and the curse and the oath that was written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us, by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under, for under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of, law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous, righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins... And for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a, a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O oh our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, and for your own sake, O oh Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. For your sake do this. Not because of our righteousness, because, but because of your great mercy. Daniel has the right perspective on prayer when he's going and he's understanding, God, you're going to come, but we're a sinful people. You don't need to save us. You don't need to return us to the land. But for your sake, you will. In your name, you will, because you're a God that promises, and you keep your promises. So this is his prayer. <clears throat> So this is his prayer. So he says, while in, in verse 20, he says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people. And, and David lumps himself in with the sin of his people, or Daniel lumps himself in with the sin of his people. He's not just saying, yeah, they're sinning, they're rebelling against you. He puts himself in with it. And presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel so the angel presenting himself, and it must be in human form, so he recognizes him, whom I have seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. So at the beginning of his plea, the word went out. Okay, so this is the context. 70 years, Daniel's believing that, okay, God's going to fulfill his promise. They're going to go back to the land. Daniel probably is not going to go back to the land. Daniel's, in, Daniel's an old man now. He's not going to be able to go back probably. Um, but for his people, he's praying. And for the sake of God's name, He's praying. And then this is the prophecy he gives him. And this prophecy is extremely challenging. Extremely challenging. And I'm not even going to sit here and say that I could answer all your questions on this or I understand this fully. Uh, I don't. Um, but I'm going to say there's two, there, there's so many different, you're going, to, you're going to say, well, that isn't what Ed said about the, the futurist view or the preacher view because there's, you might say, well, I heard this. Well, there's multiple views within the main view, okay? <laughs> so there's, there's, there's plenty of different thinking on this. But we're looking at, as we go through this prophecy, we're looking at number two on your paper, the pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view. 
So this is the view that believes the rapture is going to take place. All believers are going to be gone. They are not going through the tribulation. They are not going through that great tribulation of the little horn in Daniel 7 that's going to arise. The Matthew 24 passage that's talking about that, that great tribulation, and, and there, none of that the church is going through. It's going to be raptured out, and that's, that does not, it doesn't pertain to us. Okay? That's the view we're looking at. So futuristic in some of these things. And that's what's interesting about, you know, these, this view. It's not interesting. It's just, it's just the facts of it. That, that there's always some you get that's happened in history. And then there's the point that's future. No different than with the empires. Then all of a sudden the little horn, the, kind of the, the ten horns and the one coming out of it. Then that's future. Okay? We're going to see the same thing here, which we're going to see most, most in this room have been raised in a dispensational thinking um, and, and probably know that view better than most. So you'll, you'll probably have heard these things that I'm talking about, okay? But that's where that gap comes in, which you're going to hear. You're going to see the church age, and then there's future. Okay, so let's start and try to, try to get, get through this on this view. I'm taking a lot of this from MacArthur's thinking, okay, on this view. Here's his summary of the passage. The entire prophecy has to do with Daniel's people and Daniel's city. Daniel's people and Daniel's city. So the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. The entire prophecy. Two different princes are in this passage. If you look at verse 25, you will see, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem... To the coming of the anointed one, a prince. That prince would be the Messiah, the anointed one. Okay? Then we see a prince in 26. And after the 62 weeks, an, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That prince is the Antichrist. Okay, or the beast of Revelation 13. Um, that's who we're talking about here. So to these princes. Is that also Manolalisness? No. Um, yes, that would be the Manolalisness in yeah, Second, Second Thessalonians 2. And in Matthew 24, verse 15. And that little horn in Daniel. Um, seven coming out of the Roman Empire, okay? Because that's future. It hasn't happened yet like the other view thinks. Okay, so that's the prince. We see the time period. We see 70 weeks. Do most, what does everybody's, does, what is it, does anybody have different than 70 weeks in their Bible on verse 24, the first couple words? Does it say 70 weeks? What's that? Yep, yep. But, it's, but everybody else, is, it just says seven, 70, 70 weeks? Yeah. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so we see 70 weeks, and it's broken down. We see that first off, the first section, we see seven weeks, then we see 62 weeks, and then we see one week. And in this view, there's a gap between after the 62nd week, then we see a gap, which is called the church age, and then the final week will happen, which we don't know when that, that period would be. Then we see the time period begins at the command to rebuild Jerusalem in 25. It says, therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one. Okay? So the word to restore and build Jerusalem. Jerusalem's important in this. Okay? We'll, we'll get there in a second. But, and then it says, then he says, the end is when the Messiah, the Prince, comes. So that's when the prophecy is, is done. Okay, so let's go back to verse 24. So what's the purpose of the prophecy? The purpose of the prophecy is these six things. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, one, to put an end to sin, two, and to atone for iniquity, three, 
to bring in everlasting righteousness for to seal the prop, both vision and prophets both vision and prophets five and to anoint the most holy place six those are the purpose of this prophecy those six things so if you look at finished transgressions MacArthur would say just I'm just going to do a, a just a brief one sentence thing on on what this is because Finished transgressions, he's talking about dealing with the general sin overall. Um, to restrain sin, to restrain transgressions, that's in general sin. Transgression just means general overall. It's not um, specific. Put an end to sin, so to deal with specific sins, and then to atone for iniquity. To bring about atonement for sin. This is all referring to Christ's work on the cross. These three things, all referring to Christ's work on the cross. And this is giving a provision for sin. Because at the cross, Satan's head was, Satan was bruised, right? So, so in a sense, sin was defeated. Ultimately, at the consummation, when Christ returns, it will be done. But at that time, when Christ was on the cross, these things, in a sense, were fulfilled. Then we see the, the next three things. Bring righteousness, so God's standard, his living, which isn't happening right now. Um, they would say is happening in the future, which is going to happen during the millennium and then in eternity. So these first three things were, were ended with the cross, and then these second three things are applying to the end of time at the millennial kingdom when God establishes his thousand-year reign, and then eternity. So bring to righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, which is interesting because MacArthur is a cessationist. He believes that um, those miraculous gifts have ceased right now, but he says Joel 2 would actually be talking about vision and prophecy. He said that's going to happen in the millennial kingdom. This is interesting. I... I that's, that's what he said. So that's going to happen in the millennial kingdom. And then after that, when Christ returns in judgment, then you are going to be known as you are full. You will know as you are fully known. First Corinthians talks about just as Christ knows you, you. So you're going to know everything. Well, not everything. We're going to be learning for eternity. But we will know. We won't need vision and prophecy. And then anoint a most holy place. He says, this is the holy of holies in the temple or the restored temple of the millennial kingdom. Because the problem is that right now, if this is all future, we don't have a temple right now, right? So there has to be another temple that is going to be erected so that this can take place. So those things would be all future. So this prophecy then stretches from Daniel all the way through the millennial kingdom. Unlike the other view would sit and say, these things have been fulfilled. Not sure I can answer your question, but let, let's have it. Back to the temple. Okay. There's a temple coming again? Correct. <clears throat> this could be where? In Jerusalem, right where, and where the rock of the dome is. For how long? Um, well, it, it will definitely be at least before the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth because that's the throne he's going to sit on, and that's where the temple is going to be in the sacrificial system. That all has to happen because of Matthew 24, all those things, th this has to take place. Because the millennial kingdom is literal. Is literal. Thousand-year thousand year reign right here on earth. Okay. And, and, yeah, and that would be Ezekiel 40 to 48, what they would say is the rebuilding of the temple. And we'll get into that more next week and get a little bit uh, different thinking, a different understanding of that. Okay. So verse 24, um, we're talking about 70 weeks. This word does not mean weeks. It actually, it doesn't, doesn't mean, it means sevens, 70 sevens. It, does, it, could, it doesn't mean days. It doesn't mean weeks. It doesn't mean years. It means sevens is what it is. So scholars will say, and most everybody believes it's years. There's really no dispute over that. 
from the understanding from the Old Testament, um, first off, the 70 years that they've been in exile, the same thinking is going on. Plus, they look at Leviticus, which well, let's just flip there real quick so we can kind of have an understanding of why uh, that most these scholars take this and look at, well, why is it years? Um, 25. The Lord spoke to Moses. Um, one, sorry. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall now not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest. So you have these, these, this seven years, this, this sabbatical, this Sabbath that happens for six years, you, you take care of the land. The seventh year you rest. Most would argue that, and in, in through scripture you see in Ezekiel and other areas that talk about how often they broke the Sabbath, that they didn't let the rent, land rest for seven years. Between their, their greed and what they wanted to do, they, they sowed the field. They did these things. And some most would argue and say that you, they were exiled because they violated 70 years of Sabbath. And then you see in, in verse 8, you shall count seven weeks of years. So now it's specific. Seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. So now it's the year of Jubilee. All kinds of things happen at the Jubilee. Slaves are released, um, inheritance, all, there's all kinds of different redemptive things that happen in the year of, of Jubilee. So this same understanding, you shall count seven weeks of years, 70 times seven years. So there's a covenant context here that most scholars are sitting there thinking and they're going, no, this is talking about years in this context. And the view next week will have a, a way more understanding of that covenant type thinking and we'll have even a little better grasp of it next week, okay? But that's why they, they think years. So if that's the case, in verse 25, we know when the beginning is, or we know it's 400, 490 years. So seven, 70 times 7, we have 490 years. So that's how long the prophecy is. So if we know when the beginning is, we can know when the end is, right? So if you look in verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand from that, from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of, of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. So the start of this prophecy has to be at the word that goes out to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay? There's four decrees that happen. Most, a lot would argue they're not all decrees, but there's the decree of Cyrus that sends them back to the land. There's a decree, I'm going to call it decrees, but... Probably these last three aren't really decrees. It's more of um, fulfilling maybe even what Cyrus said, possibly. But um, Darius had a decree, and then there's two decrees by Artaxerxes. So there's four different ones. The first one, though, with Cyrus, that sends them back to the land. Most would argue, okay, it's not that. This view would argue it's not that one for two reasons. It doesn't work out for the years. If you take the years, I think the years um, is 536. So that's the decree in, in 536. Well, the problem is, is when you break out 490 years, that takes you to 54 BC before Christ. And if this has to end with the anointed one being cut off, you have a problem. Christ isn't even on the scene yet. We're like 80 years off. Okay. Secondly, they would argue and say, uh, the, the decree that Cyrus said, it was to go back and rebuild the temple. It wasn't to go back and rebuild the city, Jerusalem. Okay? The second one doesn't fit at all. The third one can fit by Artaxerxes that will drop it the 490 years, and actually it's 483 because you have the seven weeks, 
the 62 weeks. So you only have 69 weeks. 69 times 7 is 483. Okay? So that takes you... Well, I've heard it before. <laughs> so that takes you to 25 B.C. John MacArthur would argue that that's around um, his baptism. It possibly could be. It's 25, not um, A.D., sorry. Thank you for that look. Um, so 25 A.D., that's what would take us to at his baptism. Yeah, it's, I know his ministry is only three years, but and but that that's what they, there there's a, there's a, you read there's a 200 page book just on trying to figure out how these years are because the calendar is only 30 day months and um, huh no I have not read that book um, so or is it okay so that takes you to 25. Um, AD, they would say that that's not the one. They would say it's the, the next decree from Artaxerxes, which actually would take them back and it would end them at, um, I don't know the date, but it is the time of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And that would be when they say it's presenting himself as Messiah. And they say they can get this down to the day. I'm not sure, I don't, to figure that calendar and figure all that out, I don't know. But they say they can get this down to the day of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So that one fits. So that's the one they would say. So, as we're looking, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, that being the Messiah, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with square and moats, but in a troubled time. And we see the temple being rebuilt at this time, and we see in Nehemiah the struggles, the, the, the hardships of them trying to rebuild the, the temple in Jerusalem, in, in, in the city, okay, the walls, and we see all that. So it's a troubled time. So now we have 69 weeks that have happened. And after, verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. This word being cut off, killed. Um, it's actually the word that, that's used for cutting a covenant. Um, with Abraham, what did he do when, when, when God made a covenant with me? They, the animals were cut in half, killed, separated. He walked through the middle. That's this word of cutting a covenant. So he's cut off. He was killed. This is obviously talking about the Messiah. And in, in, in all views, believe that. Um, and so this is after the 69 weeks. And the people in the prince, okay, um, the one should be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and the end there shall be war, desolation, and decree. Okay, so there can be some different understandings of this. Um, some can argue that the prince of the people, let's just stick, let's stick right here and let's just say the, the, the prince of the people, this is the, the, the Roman Empire, okay? This is the prince of people. I'm going to, let me read this statement from, this is, this is a quote from John MacArthur. The people of the prince who is to come, you who... You know what happened in 70 AD, right? That was the temple was destroyed. And he says, Jerusalem was destroyed by whom? The Romans. They are the people of the prince that shall come. They're in one segment of the Roman Empire. He will be over the last segment, but nonetheless, it is the same empire. Amazing prophecy. They destroyed in 70 AD in the city of the temple, which is it's interesting to me because he takes this and he applies it to 70 AD at that time during the Roman Empire. But then he's saying it's going to be the future little horn that arises out of the Roman Empire. So I'm not seeing, sure if he's seeing that as a pattern or what. I'm, just, I was, I'm a little confused on, on what he means by that. But that's what he's saying. The people of a prince, um, 
they're the segment of the Roman, they're from the Roman Empire. Okay, so let's just keep going. So, um, to destroy the city and the sanctuary, its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war, desolation, and decree. Okay, so now after this, after the prince is cut off, this desolation happens, there's, there now is a, a, a gap period, the time of the church age. This is the time where, from the time of the prince being cut off, this is the church, and we don't know when the 70th week starts. So that 70th week could start at any point. But we do know that when the 70th week starts, there's a covenant with Israel that happens, which we see right here. So this prince is the Antichrist, so that he, in verse 27, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. This he is the Antichrist. He makes a strong covenant with the Jews for one week. And that one week is, is years, so seven years. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So this would be kind of like we see the pattern of Antiochus Epiphanes that at three years, three and a half years, this went on. And, and, and he went into the temple, set up um, abomination of desolation, destroyed the temple, um, did all this. So this, this, this Antichrist for the first three and a half years is going to set up this covenant. There's going to be peace. And then this abomination of desolation is going to happen. This great tribulation the tribulation of Matthew 24 and 15, and this is what's going to happen, this great tribulation, and then there will be, for the next three and a half years, that will happen. Then Christ will come back, set up his millennial reign for a thousand years, and then the eternal state. So, the second half of that verse, and on the wing of the abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the, creed, the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So MacArthur would say, okay, this isn't where this ends. It doesn't end with the Antichrist. You go back up to verse 24 and you see what is the end, the second half of those six things in the millennial kingdom. Bring in everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. So it's going to end with the return of Christ, him sitting on his throne, reigning in Jerusalem for a thousand years with his saints and with those on the earth, and then ultimately at the end of those thousand years will be the, the judgment in the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. I hope that didn't... I hope that was somewhat helpful. It's confusing to me sometimes as I'm saying it, as you can probably tell. Um, th there's a lot there. Um, but to take this, you see the 70 weeks. You have seven weeks. They just don't, they, they see the seven and the 62 together. It's just an odd way of saying the 69 weeks. That's going to happen, the 69 weeks. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to be cut off, killed, crucified. Then there's this church age, the age of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles. And then at the end of that, you'll have the last week back to the Jews. And he will reign. And he's going to fulfill his promises that, that supposedly weren't fulfilled already. Those land promises that are going to be given back to them, they will be fulfilled during this time frame. So hopefully that is helpful. Is anybody like that? That was the biggest waste of my time no. that I. <laughs> so are, we, are we currently after the 69 weeks? We are currently in the gap between the 69th and 70th week in this view. Okay. Because we are not going to go through the tribulation. So that has to happen in that 70th week. That 70th week is going to be the tribulation and the great tribulation in the second three and a half years. And so that's where we then would be raptured before the 70th week. But wouldn't the temple have to be starting to be built at that point? Or no? At some point, yeah, it would have to. And some, like MacArthur, would argue and say, you know what, possibly 
that peace treaty that is signed, it's possibly because he says he's going to rebuild the temple. And they rebuild the temple. Um, he's like, no, you, we're going to sign that peace treaty with you. You're going to do this. You rebuild the temple. And then that's how it comes about. Possibly. Just an interesting side note yeah. on that. If you look at uh, the, the Jews are actually planning for the third temple. They've got the cornerstone. They've got the, uh, the ornament, the gold chalices and all that. It's all set and ready to go and in their mind. Which and is they've actually chosen their Jewish leadership out of, I, I think, out of the tribe of, oh, I want to say Judah. I'm not sure that's right. Yeah, it would have to be. What's interesting about that is because I, I, I don't know how they really can get to a Jewish line and actually get to a, a priestly line anymore because it, it's so complex. I mean, it's just it, it, it's not there. The, but especially with the temple being destroyed and all the records being gone, there's there's nothing. But but what is interesting too is that they because Jews there was a. What do they call like when you the Nicene Creed they got together and council council something like that I don't yeah so they got together the Jews got together at some point after the temple was destroyed and tried to figure out well how do we make this work because we don't have a sacrificial system anymore so they basically came up with an understanding that you know what it's the giving of alms in prayers mm -hmm. so now they say it's that's what we do. And so they don't even really need the temple anymore. So it's interesting that they're even thinking in those terms. Yeah, they're actually, so, they're actually searching for the red heifer for a sacrifice. It's, yeah, there's no way they can do that right. I don't know. They but, think they can. Yeah. So, okay. Cool. Thanks for not falling asleep on me. <laughs>